Hello there. Next up is fiscal policy. Having discussed monetary, we'll now move into expansionary and contractionary fiscal. And then we'll finish this reading by comparing the two. Uh, fiscal policy, all about government spending and taxation. So if you think about aggregate demand, C plus I plus G plus X minus M, government spending is clearly in there as the G, and taxation can, in, uh, can affect, I should say, consumption. So expansionary, we are increasing government spending, decreasing taxes, kick-starting aggregate demand, and causing a budget deficit. Contractionary, decreasing government spending, boosting taxes, or both at the same time. And that will decrease aggregate demand and cool the economy. It will also reduce that budget deficit. So we know the basic definitions. Let's have a look at what people believe about fiscal policy. Keynesians are all about it. If you're a Keynesian economist, then discretionary fiscal policy can stabilize the economy. If you're in a boom period, then you want to decrease it by using contractionary, discretionary fiscal policy, and vice versa if you are in a recession. Monetarists would disagree. Monetarist belief is anything you try and do will just have a temporary effect. All you should be doing to dampen cycles is using applicable, appropriate monetary policy. That's nice, smooth monetary policy. Now, other thing on this slide, so just kind of end the debate between Keynes and monetarists there. Let's just mention automatic stabilizers. At the top here, Keynes believes you should actively try and control these cycles using discretionary fiscal policy. That means choosing to boost government spending or decrease it and boost or decrease taxes. So if you actively say, right, let's launch a government spending program that is discretionary fiscal policy. But fiscal policy to a certain extent will also happen automatically via taxation and transfer payments. So for example, let's say we are in a recession. We're in a recession, Keynesian economists would say to combat a recession with discretionary policy, well, we should boost government spending and cut taxes. Well, think about what happens during a recession. People aren't making much cash. Companies aren't making large profits. Taxation will drop. Tax revenues will fall. Plus, during a recession, the government will have to make more transfer payments, more welfare, more unemployment benefit. So government spending will automatically increase, meaning you will end up with a budget deficit. Exactly what we say should happen if you're in a recession. So make sure you can make a distinction between discretionary and automatic stabilizers. Objectives, what are we trying to do? Well, clearly the point is to influence aggregate demand and economic growth. It's easiest to see. Aggregate demand is C plus I plus G plus X minus M, as we keep saying. To redistribute wealth, so you can look at government payments to different um, consumers, different people within the economy and to affect the allocation of resources within sectors of the economy. Again, by dictating government spending, maybe giving tax breaks, and so on. So we tend to focus on the very top line there, number one, but bear in mind it can be also used to try and redistribute wealth around the economy. Tools, how do we do it? Well, we've already mentioned these automatic versus discretionary stabilizers, but a bit more detail, transfer payments we mentioned, cash payments by the government to redistribute wealth, welfare, unemployment, and so on, to a certain extent, will be part of the automatic stabilizers. And then we have current and capital government spending. Current spending on goods and services, capital spending, infrastructure, to try and support research, new technologies, green technology is a big one, and so on. So a fairly nice kind of tight set of tools. In terms of taxation and tax revenues, we've got direct and indirect taxes. Direct taxes on income or wealth, we've all seen it, we all suffer it, the downside. That can take a lot of time to implement. If you want to change your taxation system, 
as we'll see later on, it can take a long time to get through the system. Indirect on goods and services, big benefit, much quicker. You just slap on a sales tax straight away. Could be to get revenue in, could be to promote social goals, tobacco tax being the classic example. So we have our government spending, current and capital. We have our government transfer payments, welfare, unemployment. And we have direct and indirect taxes, pretty much your fiscal toolbox. So having defined it, looked at the tools that are available, let's talk a little bit more about its impact. And the fiscal multiplier. The fiscal multiplier is a good thing for fiscal policy. Why? Well, it says this. Government spending, the G in C plus I plus G plus X minus M, uh, actually has a multiplier effect because it creates more spending. Uh, one more time. C plus I plus G plus X minus M. The idea is this. We increase G, which clearly is part of aggregate demand. However, you've just put government money into the economy. That goes somewhere. It will end up in people's pockets and will therefore increase consumption, which will further boost aggregate demand. But we keep going. That consumption means people are spending. That cash will end up in other people's pockets, which will raise their consumption, which raises aggregate demand, and so on and so forth. It's the same sort of concept as the fractional reserve banking system. Putting $100 billion of government spending into the economy will have a knock-on effect and a much higher impact on aggregate demand. And we can actually work out a multiplier, much like we could work out a potential deposit multiplier in the fractional reserve system. We can work out here a government spending multiplier. It is 1 over 1 minus MPC into 1 minus T. MPC is the marginal propensity to consume. The marginal propensity to consume. So, idea is this. Whenever you put a dollar into somebody's pocket, they will either spend it or they will save it. So, for the government, they put $100 billion into the economy. First thing to note is that some of it disappears as tax, but what's left as personal disposable income is then either saved or spent on consumption. So as long as we have, and we do here, the marginal propensity to consume, 0.8, and the tax rate, T is the tax rate, 0.3, we can work out the multiplier. So with that simple formula, it's 1 over 1 minus 0.8 into 1 minus 0.3, that will give you a multiplier of 2.27 times. So put 100 billion into the economy, 2.27 times that, a $100 billion increase in government spending boosts aggregate demand by $227 billion. Magic. Slight word of caution on the next slide. Unfortunately, there is a similar effect with taxation. So levy more taxes, that will reduce personal disposable income and reduce consumption in much the same manner. So there's no new calculation, that's the great news. The multiplier is exactly as it was on the previous slide. But the good news is it only applies to consumption. So the tax increase of 100 billion only affects consumption. Well, the marginal propensity to consume was 0.8. So you only apply the multiplier to 0.8 times that 100 billion, 80 billion. So a 100 billion increase in tax revenues will decrease aggregate demand by 2.27 times just the 80, which is 182 billion. Overall impact, positive. Government spending 100 billion boosted aggregate demand by 227. Taxation increase of 100 billion reduced aggregate demand by only 182. A net positive effect. So the balanced budget multiplier is positive. So in theory at least, 
a government could finance $100 billion of government spending with $100 billion of extra tax revenue, keep its budget balanced, and see an increase of $45 billion, in this case with these numbers, in aggregate demand. So government spending multiplier positive, tax multiplier eats into it, balanced budget overall is positive. So there are fiscal tools, that's how fiscal policy should work, and the good news that the balanced budget multiplier is positive. What we now do is drift towards, as we did with monetary policy, potential issues. And here's one standout issue uh, from Ricardo, the Ricardian equivalence. It says this. Let's just kind of pick it apart carefully. Tax decrease. So what are we talking about here? A tax decrease that is expansionary fiscal policy. Let's go a step further. If you actively decide to cut taxes, that is a discretionary piece of fiscal policy, and it's expansionary. What's the point of that? Well, hopefully we know this by now. The point of an expansionary fiscal policy is to kickstart aggregate demand. Decrease taxes, increase personal disposable income, increase consumption, and off you go. However, people are not stupid. They foresee what's coming. Well, some people are, but there's enough that are not, according to Ricardo. Those taxpayers say, look, you're decreasing taxes now. I'm going to have to pay that in the future. Uh, specifically, the logic is you're cutting taxes. That means you're going to start running a budget deficit. You may finance that by borrowing. You're going to have to pay that back in the future, and that will be via higher taxes. So the benefit I feel now to my personal disposable income, well, I'm actually going to stash it away and use it to pay off my future higher taxes. In summary, all we get is an increase in saving and a decrease in consumption. We're actually changing that marginal propensity to consume. I take this extra wealth and save it to meet future higher tax invoices. Now, if that increase in saving exactly offsets the impact of the tax decrease, we have zero impact on aggregate demand. That is the Ricardian equivalence. Which means, don't bother. If you're a government and you increase government spending, fund it by issuing debt, all that will happen is taxpayers will anticipate future higher taxes as a requirement to pay back the debt and save the extra cash. Zero impact on aggregate demand. It completely blunts fiscal policy. Okay, a little bit of chat about government debt. We've mentioned that you might have to run a budget deficit if you use fiscal policy. Uh, we can look at the debt ratio. Let's not go into the exact numbers that have happened over the last decade. It's quite depressing. Or is it? Is it a cause for concern or not? We'll see in a moment. But the debt ratio itself is government debt over GDP. What happens over time, we just need to tell the examiner on the relationship between the real rate of growth and the real interest rate on government debt. If the real interest rate on government debt is below the real rate of growth of GDP, that debt ratio will decrease. In other words, your GDP is growing faster than your debt level is growing, and the debt ratio will fall. This is going up a lot quicker than this. Then your debt ratio will come down. That introduces the idea of government debt. As I mentioned, is it something to be depressed about at all? Well, yes and no. First part of the LOS says, look, yes, let's be concerned about large deficits. Why? As we mentioned with the Ricardian equivalence, Ricardo knew this. Higher future taxes probably needed to pay it off. Higher future taxes will decrease GDP growth. We don't like that. Secondly, there's this idea of crowding out. You run a large deficit, you need to borrow to finance it. If we assume there is a finite source of loanable funds and the government is using up a lot of that source, then you're going to drive up the cost of borrowing. And if you drive up the cost of borrowing, drive up interest rates, you crowd out private investment. 
the effect of the budget deficit is to cut private investment and hence eat into aggregate demand and GDP growth. And thirdly, at some point, debt becomes risky. That is the truth. So interest rates start to rise, and you may see countries defaulting or having to expand the monetary supply and causing massive inflation. Again, over the last decade, we can see countless examples, particularly in the Eurozone, of that happening. So it's a big problem. But, on the other hand, it's not. Second part of the LOS says, look, let's not worry about it. Because we're running a deficit, and we're financing capital investment. So we're using this government spending to invest in infrastructure, new technologies, green technologies, which will boost future GDP growth. So don't worry about the deficit now. As a result of it, we'll get further growth. If the Ricardian equivalence holds, well, actually, the deficit doesn't matter. You're borrowing to try and finance investment. Well, what will happen? People react to that, firms react to that, by holding on to spare cash. So you're building up savings in the economy, which means you've now got that cash, that buffer, to meet the debt repayments. And that's kind of similar to saying, look, it's on the same lines as, this debt is owed internally between your citizens. If it's not overseas, it's not so much of an issue. And finally, with this crowding out idea, look, if the economy is below capacity, you're not going to start displacing capital investment anyway. So that crowding out idea really isn't an issue. So it might be, it might not. You're not expected to conclude. It's clearly not an essay exam. So you just need to quote these arguments. Problems with fiscal policy. Well, we mentioned the Ricardian equivalence. We've also got the problem of lags. Recognition, action, and impact. First one, actually spotting that we need a fiscal policy change. The problem there is spotting, for example, that we're going into recession. Secondly, once you've managed to spot that action is required, it takes a long time to actually enact the legislation, particularly if we're looking at taxes. So getting tax legislation changed could take a long time to get through your political process. Once it's through and it becomes legislation, you have to wait for the impact. So consumers are expected to suddenly realize, I've got more disposable income. My tax rate's gone down, I've got more disposable income. I mean, they'll see it in their paycheck, but you have to wait for the feeling of that, saying, oh, actually, now I've got more spare cash, and then start going out and spending. Estimates that this entire process could last for two years. Downside, and the monetarists would jump all over this and say exactly this, what's going to happen is that actually the effect kicks in just when you don't need it. You're already out of recession by the time it kicks in, and it's actually therefore destabilizing. So as with monetary, we've defined it, we've got our tool set, and we talk about the weaknesses. Other limitations? Well, if you're already at full employment, and you go for expansionary fiscal stimulus, you're going to cause inflation. Secondly, if you're below full employment, so this is more kind of our Keynesian idea, we're below full employment, let's try and kickstart aggregate demand. Well, we might be below full employment because of supply shortages. The reason we're not at full employment GDP, the reason we're not fulfilling our potential GDP is because we can't get the supplies, the raw materials, to make stuff. So what you're doing is trying to kickstart the economy, government spending. Well, nobody can actually make anything because we don't have the raw materials. All you're doing then is causing inflation. And finally, stagflation. High unemployment, high inflation. Might be caused by an external shock, a supply shock. Fiscal policy cannot address both. So, for example, our classic diagrams, short-run aggregate supply curve has jumped back here due to a supply shock. Higher prices and unemployment. You use fiscal policy, you are kick-starting aggregate demand. You are further increasing prices. From the supply side, that is cost-push inflation. You can't address the two together. 
So, as mentioned, limitations. Analysis, just to summarize, whether we use expansionary or contractionary depends on the cycle. Clearly, in a big boom, then we're looking to calm things down and be contractionary. In a recession, we want to be expansionary. That's the idea. To finish off the reading, let's look at the interaction between the two policies, monetary and fiscal. Four situations to look at. Two of them are fairly straightforward. So, expansionary and expansionary. These arrows here are indicating loose or expansionary monetary and expansionary fiscal. And second bullet point there, contractionary monetary and fiscal. I don't think these two are particularly difficult to remember. As you'd expect, both expansionary, a strong expansionary effect. Your public and your private sectors both grow. Pretty straightforward and the exact opposite. If you have contractionary, you're bringing down GDP and both will decline. The interesting chat is around the contrast. So what if we have an expansionary monetary policy coupled with restrictive contractionary fiscal? Well, let's just make sure we can link the effects here. Interest rates will fall. Interest rates falling, that's due to a loose and expansionary monetary policy. Whenever you have expansionary monetary policy, interest rates will fall. Because interest rates have fallen, consumption, output, and the private sector expand. So what we're talking about there is the impact of monetary policy. Fiscal policy is contractionary. That tends to impact the public sector, not the private. So what's driving this chat here is the drop in rates as a result of monetary policy. Final is monetary falling and fiscal rising, i.e. contractionary monetary and expansionary fiscal. Well, you'll see interest rates rising. That is due to your contractionary monetary policy. But we have expansionary fiscal that will grow the public sector. So fiscal policy, government spending, the public sector portion will grow. And the likely impact is higher aggregate demand. So that's this reading's view of empirically what tends to happen when you interact these two policies. That does it for monetary and fiscal. As I mentioned at the top of the monetary section, pretty interesting reading. Just make sure that you stick to the readings. It's fun to look at the real world and see how these things have played out. But make sure, particularly on a slide like this, that you read into what the CFA reading says happens when these two combine. Even if you've seen, for example, the idea that there are no negative interest rates. If you've seen different things happen in the real world, remember, we're looking at the theory here before we apply it to the real world. So make sure you know what the readings have said. Don't just take it from what happened in the real world. But nonetheless, a really interesting reading on your fiscal and your monetary policies.